I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puff the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine, thank you. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I know a riddle. Oh, good. It's been a, quite a while since you asked me a riddle. Now, wait till I have my ear set. Ready? Uh, no, no, no. Wait, wait, wait till I put my thinking cap on. Ready? I just, wait, wait, let me take a deep breath. Now are you ready? <laughs> now I'm ready. Why does the hen lay an egg? Uh... So I can have two and a half minutes soft-boiled eggs for breakfast. Oh, no. That's not the real answer. All right, then. You tell me, what is the real answer? Why does a hen lay an egg? Because she can't lay a brick. Oh, oh you <laughs> fooled me. You tricked me. You hung me on a hook. I knew you'd like that. I certainly do. <laughs> now will you please read me the funny... Puck the comic <laughs> yes. weekly? Very well. I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly And on the first page, Big Ben Bull Magic words for the music, please Very well, my lady Faint and punch and dodge and twist It's a knockout blow from Big Ben's fist Big Ben Bolt and his trainer, Spider, are barnstorming the country, boxing local champions in towns throughout the United States. In a western town, Ben finds himself in the ring with a husky Indian named Chief Tallpine, who has covered his body with grease so Ben's blows will slide off. Furthermore, other Indians at the ringside are breaking other rules. The unfair fight continues, and it looks as though Ben is getting the worst of it, when a voice from the crowd shouts, Stop! And Ben sees Chief Tallpine wheel around, concern written on his face. And then he sees a tall, aged Indian chief coming through the crowd. The chief stops beside the ring, and he says, Stop. He is a fool or a sneaking jackal who would first weaken the beast he stalks with a trickery that shames the honor of his people. But if you are to wear with distinction the title of chief, you will cast aside all these guileful ways of winning victory. Last picture, top row, Chief Tall Pine stands silently as the old man goes on. I have watched you threaten and cheat so that your opponent has no chance to test his strength honestly against yours. First picture, bottom row, Chief Tall Pine says, Well, you just don't understand, my grandfather. These are the ways of the white man I follow. You forget, my son. I, too, have fought the white man at Little Bighorn, at Randall's Crossing. He fought hard, but fairly. Spider pats the Indian chief on the shoulder. That's telling him, pal. Now if you'll have Chief Horse Feathers remove that grease chest protector covering him, we can proceed with the scrap. Last picture, the old Indian says, Remove the unguent and let the battle proceed. In the manner of two braves who fight for their honor and naught else. Chief Tallpine leaps out of the ring, saying, last picture. Okay, let's go, Bolt. And when I finish fighting you brave style, you're going to be sorry you ever left Madison Square Garden. Oh, now Chief Tallpine is going to, to take the slippery grease off his body, isn't he? Yes, and next week I hope we'll have a fair fight between Ben and Chief Tallpine. Isn't it nice that that old Indian chief came and stopped the fight and got them to fight fair? Oh, you bet it is. And next week we'll find out how Ben makes out in this fair fight. Now... Now let's turn over the page, because I'm sure we'll find Prince Valiant. Very well, over the page we go. And you're right, there he is. Prince Valiant. And you remember that Val has found out that Sigurd Holm is a cruel tyrant who's been mean to his people and made slaves of some of them. And now Val is trying to help the people capture Sigurd Holm and punish him for his bad deeds. But, but Sigurd's castle...
castle is high on the hill, and Val just couldn't capture it. So Val has decided on another way to make the castle fall. Yes, he's digging a, a tunnel underneath the castle. Oh, well, I, hope, I hope he makes the castle fall, and then Sigurd will have to come out. Let's see how Val's plan is working. Here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Gray, Mulkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> gone to the people in the countryside who had been mistreated by Sigurd Holm, and has told them he intends to free them, but that he'll need their help in tunneling under the castle. So back in the forest, men are busy cutting down trees and shaping timbers to build a tunnel under the castle. Last picture top row, under cover of darkness, they are brought to the tunnel to shore up roof and walls. First picture, second row, like moles, they burrow upward under the fortress, reaching toward the brook at the far side. Val leads the way, last picture, second row, to encourage his frightened workers, for they fear this dark underground work. And then it happens. In the flickering light of the torch, a thin stream of water is oozing from the clay. Val shouts a warning. Now, get out of here, quickly! Hurry, hurry, you must get out before we drown. Val and his men hurry out of the tunnel into the fresh, cool night. Little by little, a trickle of water grows larger and larger. Until first picture bottom row by morning, a stream of thick, muddy water is pouring from the tunnel's mouth. The guard on the castle wall sees what's happening and shouts a warning. Oh, oh, look below! Sigurd Holm himself goes to look at the strange behavior of the stream. No longer does it flow around his house. Now it is disappearing into an ever-widening hole under his walls. And then, as he stands there, he sees the clay hill under the platform of his castle fall away. Last picture, some distance away, Val and Rufus watch the water eating away underfoot. And Val says, Well, now let's put an edge on our weapon. Tomorrow will be a working day. You bet it'll work. Sigurd's castle is going to collapse right on his head if he doesn't get out of there in a hurry. Yes, but but if Sigurd comes out of the castle, then Val and his men, his knights, are, are going to have to fight him. You bet he'll fight them. And I'll bet you Val will win. Well, Sigurd has more men than Val, so it won't be an easy fight. We'll find out more about that next week. Now, how would you like to read Robin Hood? Oh, you just know I'd love to read Robin Hood. Very well, then. Go over the page, and there he is on page five. Yes, and you remember last week, Robin Hood and his father were at the Nottingham Fair in the archery contest. And both of them beat Red Gill, who was one of the men of the dishonest Prince John. And then, the new sheriff, a man named Delacy, who's dishonest too, asked Robin Hood and his father to go to work for him because they were such a good shot. But Robin Hood and his father wouldn't have anything to do with these dishonest men. And then, then that made Delacy angry, and so he whispered something to his men, and he was very angry about it, and I wonder if anything will happen to Robin Hood. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with the story of Robin Hood. It's merry, merry England in days long ago. Time now for Robin Hood. Some music. Hi ho! After leaving Nottingham, Fitzsooth and his son Robin set out for Huntington through Sherwood Forest. As they walk along, Robin says to his father, A man who defied the sheriff as you did, sir, must be very wary now. Then, without warning, there's a vicious whirring sound. <coughs> and an arrow thuds into the back of Robin's father. Quickly, Robin drops to the ground beside his father. An act that saves his life, for an arrow meant for him whizzes over his head. Father! Father! As Robin looks into the still face of his father, he's filled with hatred for the man who shot the arrow. And last picture, top row, crouching low, Robin stalks the archer who is stalking him. Through an opening in the clearing, Robin sees the man. It is DeLacy's man who Robin defeated at the Nottingham Fair in the archery contest. Robin says grimly as he takes careful aim, As I thought, it is Red Gill. <laughs> Robin scores the bullseye. First picture bottom roll, Red Gill drops dead. As Robin stands over the still figure of Red Gill, he hears the hoofbeats of approaching horsemen. 
He looks around and sees men coming into the clearing and exclaims, The sheriff's booming. Quickly, he runs into the underbrush. DeLacy and the sheriff's men see Red Gill lying on the ground and Robin disappearing through the trees. They shout, After him! After him! And so, last picture, Robin seeks refuge in the depths of Sherwood Forest, a fugitive from the cruel sheriff and the wily Prince John. Well, now I know what DeLacy whispered in his men's ear. He told them to kill Robin and his father. Yes, that's what he told them. And now Robin won't dare to show his face in any of the castles because the sheriff will have him arrested, won't he? I'm afraid so. Oh, my. What will happen to Robin next? Well, we'll find out more about that next week. Now let's turn over the page and look. There's Donald Duck. Oh, that funny little Donald. I just love him. And we won't waste a minute. Say the magic words with me, please. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squeeze them, squeeze them, Let's have music to better quack, quack. Donald has taken his girlfriend, Daisy, out on the lake fishing. Daisy says, Oh, I'm so thrilled. I've never fished with a rod and reel before. Donald stops rowing and says, Well, first you anchor close to the shore. And he throws in the anchor. And Donald hands Daisy her rod and reel. She leans back and then casts. Ah, oh, the girl cast it way out and then reel it in. Daisy begins reeling in. When the line comes out of the water, they see the hook is gone. Oh, my goodness, look, that nasty fish bit my hook off. Last picture, top row, Donald ties a new hook on her line, saying, Oh, well, no harm done. Try this hook with a wire leader. Daisy leans back and then casts. First picture, bottom row, she begins to reel in. Half hour later, Daisy is reeling in again. Out of the water comes her line, and the hook is gone again. Daisy says, second picture, bottom rope. Why, Bob Monster, he's stolen his seven times now. Donald snarls. Nine. And then he opens his tackle box and snaps. Okay, now we go home. Look, Tux, empty. And then Donald dumps the tackle box into the bottom of the boat, turns around and picks up the oars, and his hat pops off. For he sees, last picture, the nine hooks that Daisy has lost snagged in a tree limb on shore. Oh, um, and his eyes roll around in his head. Daisy exclaims, And now what's the matter? That was a joke on Donald and Daisy. Yes, when Daisy whipped the rod back over her head, the hooks got caught in a tree limb. And actually, when she whipped the rod forward, the string broke, and there the hooks hung in the tree. <laughs> oh, those silly ducks. They thought the fish were biting them all. Yes, they must be pretty blind not to see that the hooks weren't on the line. Oh, yes, that was so funny. I just love him. So do I. Well, now it's time for Flash Gordon. Oh, I'm anxious to read that. All right, let's turn to the very last page of the first section. All right, and there he is. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the last page of the first section, Flash Gordon. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. riga riga doon doon saskamatash Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash was returning to Earth in his rocket ship when he was captured by Pyron, a cruel man who was trying to rule the world. Pyron has solved the mystery of controlling a comet, a huge star. He has a mad plan to destroy the Earth by crashing his comet against it, and so he aims the comet for Earth and speeds toward it faster and faster. The observers on Earth see the approaching comet speeding straight toward them. Panic sweeps the earth, and martial law is declared as the doomsday comet races toward a collision that would undoubtedly destroy our planet. Every hour, the giant fireball in the sky looms bigger and bigger, and more and more threatening. The end of the world is in sight. Last picture, top row. Aboard the space sphere, inside the comet's gas-filled head, the mystery girl, Flamma, pretends to help Flash. She whispers, here's a passkey. If you can learn the secret of Pyron's cosmic power, we can control the planet and save our Earth. First picture, bottom row. No sooner does that guard depart than Flash prepares to act. He tells Dale, I don't trust that girl. She probably wants to take over the comet herself. But we've got to take that chance. 
ordering Dale and Zarkov to remain behind in their cell. Flash tries the pass key in the lock. But an electronic metal detector spots Flash's key and sounds a noisy warning. Instantly, Flash is overwhelmed by a swarm of scaly comet men. As he goes down under the savage charge, the leader barks a command. Throw the Earthman outside into the fire gas! As they open the airlock, Flash's picture... The Comet men revel in the gassy heat of their native world while Flash collapses at the first faint touch of the Comet's atmosphere. And suddenly, Flamma's voice is broadcast into the airlock. Don't throw him overboard, guards. Bring him to the Comet Master Pyron for judgment. Oh, I'm glad that Flamma has stopped him from throwing Flash overboard because he would have been killed dead in those awful flames. Yes, he would. Now, although he's still a prisoner, he may still have a chance to outsmart Pyron and Flamma. I wonder what Pyron's judgment will be when Flash is brought before him. Well, we'll find that out next week. Now let's pick up the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly. Oh, and there's Dagwood and Blondie. And here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Ramafu, Ramafum, Zim Zam Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Dagwood has been taking care of Mr. Dither's parrot while Mr. Dither's was away for a week. Oh, hi, boy. Hi, boy. First picture, second row. Answer the door. Answer the door. Dither's arrives at Dagwood's house to get the parrot and take it home again. He says, Oh, Dagwood, dear boy, how is my darling Claire Bell? I can't wait until I see her. Dagwood answers, Oh, she's fine, boss. We treated her like one of the family. Mr. Dither's goes to the cage and takes his parrot out. Hi, boy. Hi, boy. Seeing that his parrot is all right, Dithers, first picture, third row, drops to his knees and kisses Dagwood's hands. Dagwood, to show my gratitude, I'm going to give you a raise, and you'll get an extra week of vacation with pay. Last picture, third row, that night at the Dithers' house, Mr. Dithers and his wife are lying in bed. Mr. Dithers is just about to drop off to sleep, when suddenly from the other room he hears... He sits up with a jerk. Mr. Dithers is a baboon. Dithers leaps out of bed, dashes into the other room. Hi, boy. Hi, boy. First picture, bottom row, he stares in astonishment as the parrot chatters. The boss is a pinhead. What's that? Mr. Dithers is a tight one. Dithers snarls. So that's what they say about me around their house. A moment later, at Dagwood's house, Dagwood, waking from a sound sleep, exclaims, be phoning us at 2 a.m. He gets out of bed, staggers to the phone. Hello? Last picture, Dagwood's face is covered with dismay as he yells, Blondie, we're fired! <laughs> <laughs> the parrot learned everything that Dagwood said about Mr. Dithers. And then he went right home and repeated it so Mr. Dithers could hear it. Yes, poor Dagwood. I wonder if he's really fired. Well, we'll find out for sure next week. Now look underneath Dagwood and Blondie. There's Roy Rogers. Oh, yes, and Roy's been having trouble with two crooks named Shanks and Carstairs who are trying to steal a Box K ranch away from a boy named Teddy Knox, whose father had just died. Yes, Roy rescued Teddy from drowning in quicksand, where Shanks had thrown the boy. And while Roy was talking to the boy, on a cliff above, Shanks was watching, and he took out a rifle and he was aiming it at Roy, just at the end of last week's story. I, I wonder if Roy gets shot. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Ayip Fayo, now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Ayip Fayo! <laughs> Shanks takes careful aim at Roy by the bridge below. Suddenly, Carstairs pulls up the rifle, saying, Don't shoot Rogers and young Knox, you fool. There's an easier and a safer way to get to Knox Ranch. And then they hear a wagon and look below and see the sheriff and Roy's friend, Corny Maxim, gallop up. Shanks knows he can't shoot Roy now. Carstairs says, third picture, top row. Come on, we'll intercept the stage and sell the ranch to my client before he reaches town. I'll forge Teddy Knox's name on the bill of sale. Roy quickly tells the sheriff what's happened. First picture bottom row, the sheriff mounts Teddy's horse and says, Well, I'll head for town and keep an eye open for shanks and car says, Rogers. Roy replies, Okay, sheriff, and we'll be at the box K in case they return. 
Meanwhile, a little later, Shanks and Carstairs intercept the stagecoach and stop it. Hold them jugheads, gents. Pull up! Whoa, whoa. Blasters. Road agents. The men in the stagecoach hold up their hands. Carstairs rides up and says, This is not a hold-up, gentlemen. I'm lawyer Carstairs. I have urgent business with one of the passengers, uh, B.J. Lowry. <laughs> the door of the stagecoach opens, last picture. And a beautiful girl steps out and says that she's Betty Jane Lowry and asks if they're the gentleman who advertised a ranch for sale. And Carstairs stammers, well, well, What's this? A girl! <laughs> Got there in time, so Shanks couldn't shoot Roy. So am I. <laughs> what do you think of that girl in the stage school? That's a surprise, isn't it? Yes, it's a surprise to Carstairs and it's a surprise to me. I thought it would be a man. So did I. Well, next week we'll find out whether Carstairs can sell Teddy's ranch to this girl. Now is it time for Dick's adventure? It is, and we'll find Dick on the very last page of Puck the Comic Weekly. So turn to the very last page. That last week, that Dick was taking an Indian chief named Tecumseh down the river in a raft, trying to get Tecumseh to a doctor because Tecumseh had been hurt in a fight with knives with his brother. That's another Indian chief who was named the Prophet. That's right. Tecumseh is an enemy of the white man, and he's told this to Dick. But this doesn't make any difference to Dick. Dick plans to help Tecumseh anyway because he's wounded. And then all of a sudden, they heard the sound of soldiers coming towards them. Yes, American soldiers, friends of Dick's. Now we'll read and see what happens next in Dick's Adventure. Say the magic words with me. A riggedy pack of that is it. That's that music for Adventure with Dick. Last picture, Dick sees the American soldiers approaching and says, Hey, to come see. I see my friends and your enemies, a long column of American regulars. Tecumseh walks toward the forest, away from the approaching soldier, for he knows he'll be captured if they see him. First picture, second row, Dick says, Hey, Tecumseh, come with me. Be friends with us. Your people and ours can live together without fighting. Tecumseh says, Go back to your own soldiers, Dick. And, Dick, take this ring, for I owe my life to you, and always will I remain your friend. Suddenly, out of the forest, last picture, second row, Dick sees many Indians emerge. Tecumseh smiles and says, Many men are drawing near Dick, but this time they are my friends and your enemies. First picture, bottom row. The warriors proclaim their missing chief with shouts of joy. And then they turn ominously on Dick. But Dick's eyes are glued on one of the party, a white trapper carrying a pouch marked with the Royal British insignia. A plan quickly forms in Dick's mind. Last picture, he makes a sudden grab for the British courier's pouch, only to be seized by two burly Indians. Oh, I wonder what's in that pouch that Dick's grabbing. I wonder, too. Maybe some important messages. You mean some important messages from the British to the Indians? Or about them. Well, well, what happened to the American soldiers? Why didn't Dick join them? Well, all of this is something we'll find out next week. Now look underneath Dick's adventure. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, and this I'm anxious to see because Tex and Rusty and the radio man went back to the ship that Blackie had tried to sink. And the radio man sent a message to the Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard had brought Blackie Kirk and Captain Trump onto the ship again. And I'm sure now that the Coast Guard men will find out that Blackie tried to sink the ship so that the horses from the Milestone Farm would be drowned. And I hope that the Coast Guard men will put him in jail for trying such a terrible thing. Well, let's read and find out right now. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and rusty. First picture, Tex comes up on deck and meets the Coast Guard officer who has just come aboard with Blackie and Captain Crump. The officer says, I'm a Coast Guard officer. You members of the crew of this freighter? What about these youngsters? The old sailor who became Rusty's good friend answers, Well, I belong to the crew, sir. Tex says, Well, the boys and I, uh, well, I guess you'd call us supercargo. We're looking after a shipment of young horses. The Coast Guard officer asks, Now, how do you happen to be aboard? Captain Crump says he gave orders to abandon ship. The sailor answers, Aye, sir, he did. And all hands took to the boats. We thought we were going on the rock, sir. Once Captain Crump set our course straight for them, 
Last picture, top row, Captain Crump protests. That's a lie. Our radio was out of commission. We had no storm warning. When the gale hit us and drove us toward the rocks, we couldn't even send an SOS. First picture, bottom row. Sparks, the radio man that Blackie had tried to kill, steps forward and says, Oh, ex excuse me, sir. I'm the radio operator of this ship. I want to report that we did get storm warning. And the reason we didn't send an SOS was because my transmitter was deliberately wrecked by that man, Kirk. Captain Crump whispers to Blackie, It's Fox. He didn't grow. It's all up with us now. Crump and Blackie start for the Coast Guard launch. But before they made two steps, the Coast Guard officer and Sparks color them. No, oh, no, you don't. You two are under arrest, pending an investigation. And then Rusty says, Hey, look, here come the tugs to pull us off the sandbar. <laughs> Sometime later, at a small farm a mile from the village, Rusty and Pete are taking care of the horses, which had been brought from the ship safely without a scratch. And then Tex pulls up. Last picture, he gets out of the car. Hey, what happened, Tex? Why, Jingo, it's hard to believe, boys. Those ornery varmints broke down and confessed that the whole thing was a scheme to collect insurance on these horses. They had the whole 12 of them insured for a pile of dough as Milestone Farm Thoroughbred. Goody, everything turned out all right. The, the horses are safe and the crooks are in jail. And Rusty and Tex and Pete are safe. Everybody is happy. Except Blackie and Captain Crump. I hope they never have a chance to do anything mean like this again. So do I. Now do you think we'll start a new adventure with Rusty and Tex and Pete? Why, I'm sure we will. Now, that's all the time I have, but before I go... Here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all your boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Comic Biggie Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all your boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Mm -hmm.